Welcome to EPG Partshala. Today we are going to discuss the module Politics and Indian Modernity, Gandhi's Politics, Central Arguments in Hind Swaraj. This module is written by Bindu Puri of University of Delhi. I am Raghuram Raju from University of Hyderabad. There are two important background influences to this now famous book Hind Swaraj by M. K. Gandhi. One was the widespread but sporadic violence during 20th century, early 20th century. Several British officials were killed by natives. For instance, there is an assassination of Sir William Curgeon Wiley, who is the ADC to the Secretary of State for India by Madanlal Dingra. There are several other things. Now, what is important about the sporadic but widespread violence is the fact that it created a kind of a feeling where one was in a state of confusion. The confusion was that is violence justified? Yes, colonialism is not justified, but is use of violence justified in driving the British out? Is one of the major problems that was going around that time. Now it is in this context you have, for instance, people like Sri Aurobindo withdrawing from politics because of this confusion related to the sporadic violence at that time. There is also instances where uh, um, uh, people like Rabindranath Tagore retires from politics and takes more towards literature. So now, you know, this symbolically represents the kind of confusion that was there to this thing. These two instances are available in the preface in the book Truth Called Them Differently. Now, what is important is that violence was one of the backgrounds to Gandhi's Hind Swaraj. The second important background that provided a, uh, a, a, you know, a general atmosphere for this book, Hind Swaraj, is Tolstoy's famous letter, which is called as Letter to a Hindu, which he wrote to Tarakna Das journal, pamphlet journal, Free Hindustan, in which he recommended non-violence for Indians. Now you see that that is also very important background. In fact, Gandhi translated this letter and published it in Gujarati and English in his journals. So this is the background. There is also a more focused context to Hind Swaraj. The first context is modernity and modern civilization. The second context is the political context which has history, immediate history. One is the South Africa experience and political movement Gandhi was associated with in South Africa. So this is a very important thing because it provided Gandhi a gaze towards India from outside. So it gave Gandhi an outside gaze from where he could see India differently. Different from people who saw India from within India. So that is a South African experience is very, very important. The second one is the politics of expatriate Indians, which includes Vidi Savarkar, who became the ideologue of Hindutva, and Sham Krishan Verma. They were very active and they were also participants in the violent struggle for independent ind independence. 
And the third one is the larger Indian national movement. So you have these three important historical contexts that provided a background to this book, Hind Swaraj. So let us now look at what is the structure or form of Hind Swaraj. Hind Swaraj is written in a dialogical form. It is a dialogue between a newspaper editor, who is Gandhi himself, and the reader. And the reader stands for the Purva Paksha. And the reader stands for Purva Paksha. And interestingly, Gandhi wrote it in Gujarati. And he said that Gujarati language is conducive for writing dialogues. Okay. So the important aspect of this dialogue is a subtext. And what is the subtext? That Gandhi, through this dialogical exposition of his doctrine, of his views on Hind Swaraj, is I think sending a message saying that we have to enter into a deliberative negotiations with the British. The freedom struggle has to be not fought through physical violence, through physical action, but it has to be a negotiation, it has to be a deliberation with the other. So I think it is in that context that the dialogical form of the text has certain serious subtext that goes a long way in shaping the nature of Indian freedom struggle. The, the other important aspect of this dialogical nature of this text apart from these immediate requirements is that it also participates in a very important way the classical genre within Indian philosophy called the debates. Now one of the important aspects of a dialogue or a debate is, as I pointed out, that it begins or initiates a deliberative negotiation with the other or your opponent and not to combat the opponent through physical violence. That's the important thing that I already pointed out. But on a positive note, what a debate or a dialogue also you know, uh, 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 presents before you is that when I enter into a debate or when I enter into a dialogue, I have already taken the other into consideration. The other into consideration. That is, it is not a doctrine where I say something and people listen to it and they follow it. No, that, that's not the kind of a nature a dialogue takes. In a dialogue, you say something and immediately the other opposes it. So the other is there, not subsequently, but simultaneously. It is not there subsequently, but simultaneously. Now, if it is there, then what happens is the dialogue or a debate would allow a critical scrutiny, a rational argument, the kind of a justification that you have to give for my idea. So it saves in the, the enterprise from either becoming authoritarian or becoming orthodox. It also gets the other imbricated and this will be very conducive to be used in a public domain. In a public domain, in a dynamic way, not in a authoritative or following way. So that's the important aspect of this text, one of the important subtexts of this text. But let me just move from the structure of the text to the authors of several texts in 20th century. One of the fascinating aspects of 20th century India is, of course, the freedom struggle, which is a very important uh, event in 20th century Indian history. But what is important also is most of the people who are active in political domain, fighting against the British in different ways, in different ways, with different dispositions, also happen to be a prolific writers. Okay, so this is a very interesting thing. You have poet Tagore, who wrote extensively, also participated 
in the freedom struggle. You have Gandhi, I mean, whose writings are now in 100 volumes, who is also active in politics. You have Nehru, you have uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda, you have Sri Aurobindo, you have Bharat Ratna, Ambedkar, all of them also were prolific writers. So that is a, one of the important aspects of it. Now what is important is how does one look at these act politicians who are also writers? How does one theorize them is a very important and open question that we may have to attend to it, you know, seriously. So there is a philosophical material in the writings of Gandhi, but what is the academic method or philosophical method behind these writings is what I think we need to do more work on that. So if you look at identify the philosophical aspects in Gandhi, they are the following. One, the idea of Swaraj, the idea of non-violence, the idea of rights, the relation between rights and duties, what is the civilization, his critique of modern civilization, his take on nationalism. So there are several ideas that are discussed in this book of Hind Swaraj by Gandhi. And they are also discussed in other writers' works in different ways. So we will now, in this module, confine ourselves to Gandhi's Hind Swaraj. So if you come to the theme of the, this text, one of the major theme that Gandhi engages in this text is what is a true civilization? And is modern civilization a true civilization? According to Gandhi, modern civilization is not a civilization. He says that it is a satanic civilization. So look at the use of the word satanic civilization. Now please remember Gandhi its use of satanic civilization has lot of meanings associated with it. Let us look at one or two meanings of it. He uses a religious metaphor and also a Christian metaphor in designating the modern civilization. Now, he is not saying that modern civilization is bad for India. He is saying that it is equally bad, if not more, to the West. So, you know, he says that he is now abandoning that binary that was in vogue at the time between India and the West, or India versus the West, which is one of the thematic, thematics of the Indian nationalism, that Indian versus British, Indians versus Westers. Now, Gandhi introduces a new kind of, a different kind of a binary, and that binary is that modernity versus non-modernity, modernity versus pre-modern, in saying that it is a satanic civilization. So now, instead of saying that modern civilization is bad for India, he is saying it is equally bad for the West. So in other words, he identifies, in fact isolates, and in that, you know, brings down the realm of modern civilization and increases the realm of the non-modern. That includes not only Indians, but also non-modern Westerns. I think that is a, one of the important strategies that Gandhi seems to be introducing by saying that it is a satanic civilization. So the metaphor, satanic civilization, has to be read more carefully than we have done. Okay, so he is telling the British that you are trying to modernize India and we are not just opposing that because we are not interested in modernity. We are opposing it because it is equally bad for you. So not only you, know, you reflect upon how to implement modernity in India, but you also deliberate whether what you are implementing in India is good to you or not. Okay, I think that's a, one of the very important strategies that Gandhi has proposed, which, is, which has long consequences. So then he goes on to say that modern civilization is irreligious. It is materialistic. It is consumeristic. 
he emphasizes on the ceaseless production. It is not bothered about who is producing. It is just bothered about just production. And it will also go to the extent of saying that modernity is interested in producing for the sake of production. Now, Gandhi would say that I think the emphasis is not on production. The emphasis is not even on distribution as Marx later you know, um, uh, argued. I think Gandhi will put premium on the restraints on consumption. He would say that we should consume less. Okay, So that is the most important aspect and that will go against the modernity. Modernity would proliferate production. Gandhi would say that will lead to material consumption and outwardly growth. It will scuttle the inward growth. It will take us away from our own being. It will take us away from our spiritual and religious notions. So that's the reason why, for instance, he says that excessive consumerism and modernity takes human beings away from nature and God. And that is not good. Modernity makes material well-being as the center and the only thing that is important. It doesn't bother about the spiritual well-being. That is the reason why he is not making a case establishing this by saying that you become religious. No. The point that he makes is that human being is not to be equated with material being. From this, we should not think that he is saying that you join a particular religious you know, establishment. That's not the point that he's saying. He's saying that there is an inner core of human being, human self, and that core has spiritual elements and they have to be attended to. This is inwardness is very important and at least the outwardness should be in proportion to the inwardness. And Gandhi would see, for instance, as anticipated much later, that he would say that modernity has no concern for environment okay it destroys it sees everything as a commodity it will not have a notion of sacredness so he would say that in trying to produce more on a large scale okay it uproots people from their traditional crafts from their traditional productive domains now for instance this can be for uh, you can take uh, an example and find out that what is important uh, uh, in Gandhi is Gandhi is not just critiquing development. What Gandhi is critiquing is dislocation. Okay, Modernity not merely develops but it dislocates. Now for instance several people argue what if you, dis you are dislocated. Okay, People say that we will build a big dam and then we will compensate them, we relocate them. Now, you understand, I, I was talking to some, uh, uh, some IAS or probationers and then I asked them, what will, you, f what will be you, your reaction if you are transferred from one place to other place? Doesn't it pain you? Some of them said, yes, it pains you. But if that dislocation can pain you, imagine the kind of dislocation that is meted to the people when you go for big dams and then dislocate them from the places which have memory of their ancestors and things like that. So that is the reason why Gandhi seems to be saying that modernity is irreligious. It is a satanic civilization because it dislocates people. It, it is in dislocating, it introduces a very incompensatable, uncompensatable alienation. That is the point that I think he seems to be making in his critique of modernity. In addition to critiquing modern, modernity and its consumptive attitude, Gandhi also critiqued the modern institutions like parliament, and modern technology like railways, machinery, and modern professions like lawyers and doctors. See, for instance, he said that one of the reasons why uh, uh, what happens in a parliament is that you are not interested in the truth. You are interested in all the time opposing the other person and not seeing what the other person is saying. So he's saying that that takes the you know, form of a professional politics where individuals' concerns do not figure. 
you know, they, if they figure, they figure in forms of averages, in terms of generalizations. So the individuality gets lost in these democratic averages. That's a, one of the points that he seems to be making. He also seems to be saying that railways, the transport system, moves what is produced from one place to the other, and then it brings a lot of disturbances, and also it generates a lot of inequality. There is also another dimension that it seems to be uh, you know, encouraging, namely, it generates a lot of alienation. That a person who produces do not know who is the consuming. This is one of the important aspects that uh, is discussed in Marx in his doctrine of alienation. So similarly, he would say that a lawyer is the one who is not bothered about what is the truth of the case. But the emphasis is on the expertise of the lawyer, the argumentative power of the lawyer, and the kind of lawyer that you can and you can employ. That is the most important thing. The doctors, he takes doctors for a ride. He says that doctors are not interested in merely curing the patient. In saying that, now they will say, say, they will not say that <clears throat> you know, cut down on consumption, find out what is the cause for your disease. Instead, they would say they will cure. Okay? And then there is a lot of professionalism and the curing is related to making money and things like that. And there is also a, an aspect where doctors are concerned only about the body. They are not concerned about the non-bodily aspects of human being. And for Gandhi, that is also equally important. Having said this, let's also look at two important aspects in this context. One, Gandhi is not shunning everything in modernity. He is embarking a large critique of modernity, but he is not, uh, he doesn't practice untouchability towards modernity. There are many things in modernity that he very freely and without any, uh, any, any inhibitions uses. He made use of railways, he made use of telephone, his, his he started journals, which is a modern institution, printing press and things like that. But all of them have been modified in its use. They don't dominate. They have become merely an instrument of a larger well-being of people. That's the important thing. See, there are any important aspects of, uh, 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 of, uh, of things that he borrowed from outside. One of the important uh, uh, things that he borrowed from Christianity is the virtues of manual labor. This is pointed out by A.L. Basham. The other important aspect that he borrows from modern um, branch of feminism, according to Basham, is the importance of women, the centrality of women. But interestingly, both these things, one, the virtues of manual labor and the importance of women, which were at the fringe of Indian society, Gandhi sought to bring to the center. And Ashish Nandi's article the, uh, uh, shows that the politics behind association shows how, for instance, this is what cost Gandhi his life. Okay, so Gandhi is ambivalent, there is an ambivalent attitude towards these kinds of things that we need to take into consideration. The important ideas, positive ideas that we have in Gandhi is Swaraj, which is freedom. The other important aspect is the concept of non-violence. Gandhi is a proponent of non-violence and Gandhi uh, brings non-violence in the time when violence was seen as indispensable. Please remember that there are two world wars. Now Gandhi brings non-violence okay, against this indomitable background. That's the most important thing. Now please remember that idea of non-violence is not authored by Gandhi. The idea of non-violence is borrowed from Jainism. Jainism has a metaphysical justification for non-violence, in support of non-violence. Gandhi uses this metaphysical idea from Jainism 
and makes it available in the public domain. That is the contribution of Gandhi. That is the major contribution of Gandhi. And the second major contribution, as I just now pointed out to you, is that he brings into the center stage of politics, non-violence, when violence is seen as indispensable. That is the major achievement of Gandhi. So Gandhi also argued that we should not merely send British out and leave and retain their British institutions. He said that is not a full Swaraj. Swarna, Swaraj is not merely sending the British and not their institutions. He thought that we have to have Swaraj of idea of uh, Swaraj both in politics and also in, in terms of social institutions. Having said this, what is important to remember is that Gandhi is one of the prominent figures amongst others in India who always identified the internal evils in Indian society. So whenever he criticized other others, it is always preceded by, prefaced by criticizing oneself. See, for instance, he says that I am against Shuddhi, Talibi and proselytization. Look at the ordering that he is criticizing conversions, but he starts with the Indians' attempts to convert. Okay, so the internal criticism always preceded the external conversion, uh, external criticism. This is one of the hallmarks of Gandhi's, you know, uh, philosophy, and that you find in not only in Sin Swaraj but also in other pieces. So Swaraj is one important aspect. The inner freedom of an individual, not merely outward material growth, is another important thing. And Gandhi also has this very important take on means and ends. He said that means also should justify ends, not merely end justify means. So that's the reason why he said that if you are fighting against the British, now you should fight not using violence, but using non-violence. Okay, that's the, and then for him, non-violence is not the instrument of the weak. A non-violent person is a person who has the ability of a sattvic. Sattvic is a person who knows how to strike but restrains from it. Because for Gandhi asked this question, the question that Gandhi asked, what is the purpose of politics? If the purpose of politics is to bring people together, violence will not bring people together. Okay? If you use violence, violence separates people together. If and that defies the purpose of politics, Gandhi would say that it is non-violence that brings people together. So he would say that, that politics have to invariably use violence if its purpose is to bring people together. Okay, and that's the important point that you know comes to prevail in his writings. The most important point. Uh, um, in Gandhi is truth. In some places he said that he will make you know, uh, amendments to the, his doctrine of non-violence. Sometimes he will say that you know, violence is inevitable. But he would never make compromises about truth. Having said that, there is something that he introduced which we must factor. And that is the following. Before Gandhi, the the statement that was doing rounds was, God is truth. Now, if God is truth, then there is some problem associated with it. The problem is, if you want to access truth, you have to access truth only through religion. Because God, God, uh, uh, truth is part of religion. Okay. Now, if you, are do, if you are not a believer of religion, then you can't access truth because truth is imbricated within religion. I think Gandhi makes a very subtle but a substantial move where he says it is truth that is God. In other words, truth can be accessed even if you don't believe in God. Okay, So that, I think, democratizes truth more than it was capable of in that thing. So it is in that sense that though there are very synoptic small moves, but they have very important 
you know, uh, uh, meanings, subtext associated with them. There is a need to look at these subtext and then make a better sense of this text called Hind Swaraj. So there are several serious issues that are there in this tiny text called Hind Swaraj. And our job is to read the text more seriously, identify the core ideas and decipher the associated meanings which are there in, in the text and also see that the text is related to a larger context and then we will be able to understand the text in particular and the larger context in general properly. Thank you.